So let me just first. Okay, so. Uh, um, all right, so okay, so let me uh, just uh, briefly introduce our speaker today. Uh, so first of all, welcome all, you know, uh, to to join this One World Mathematics of Machine Learning uh, seminar. And and today, you know, we're very glad to have our speaker, uh, you know, Professor Zhi Qing Xu, um, uh, you know, from uh, Shanghai Jiao Ping University. He's a he's a associate professor uh, from the Institute of Natural Science and also the School of Mathematical Sciences. And and, and it's, you know he has been working exclusively in you know theory of deep learning and also uh, computational neuroscience. I think he's he's best known for his uh, his work uh, you know on uh, uh, frequency principles and also recently parameter condensations and embedding principles. And he has also done some very uh, you know pioneering work in uh, in bridging machine learning and also scientific computing. So um, so you know without further ado. Uh, let me give the stage uh, to Zhi Qing. Zhi Qing, go ahead. Thanks, Dong Bing, and thanks, Chen Xiao, for the uh, invitation. And it's a very great opportunity to share our recent works. So today my talk is about simple bias in deep learning. Um, so we know that a deep neural network looks very normal. It's just a composition of linear and nonlinear functions. However, it can power us AlphaGo, AlphaFold, GPT-4, and so on. So we definitely have questions why they can do so well. And we want to study it from theory, but why we need a theory for deep neural networks. So I want to give an examples uh, from chemistry. So if we want to turn the Cooper into gold, we know it's not possible once we study the chemistry and we can avoid a lot of energy wasting. We also know that we can turn the wood carbon into diamond. So we can build uh, artificial diamond. It's quite common around. And so for understanding deep neural networks, we aim to understand what deep neural networks are good at and what is difficult for them to learn. For example, so I will mention about high frequency is quite difficult. So once we want to do a theory, we, we want to know what is a good theory. So some basic criteria, it must have revealed some interesting phenomenon or some theoretical questions. And it sh should be also simple enough for analysis and also complex enough to illuminate our concerned issues. And what once you start uh, have some theory, you should be able to verify it by experiments. And there are also more advanced criteria. It should lead to more interesting phenomenon or theories, or you can guide for designing algorithms. So we will use this criteria to judge our theory. So we call the such study phenomenon driven uh, theoretical research or artificial neural science. So we want to ask if neural network is really uh, so complex. And the answer is yes, it can fit almost any uh, continuous function once it's large enough. So neural network is quite complex. However, our traditional theory tell us if the model is too complex, it will lead to overfitting. But for neural networks, it still generates well even the number of parameters is much larger than the number of training data. And this problem actually is quite for quite uh, has existed for quite a long time. And in this talk, we want to ask: Is neural network really so complex in practice? Because in practice, that is what we concern. So in 1995, Leo Brinkman has proposed a series of questions such as why don't heavily parameterized neural network overfit in the data? And also some other questions. And he also mentioned a very key point. Mathematical theory is not critical to the development of machine learning, but scientific inquiry is. So in this talk, we are going to start from some basic experiments, try to understand more about neural network and build some uh, theory. So it's kind of scientific inquiry. So in this talk, I will uh, briefly mention about the frequency principles as an example, and also will mainly focus on condensation. So for frequency principle, we use an example. And this red curve is our target function. And we want to use our neural network to learn this target function. So this will be a, a film and each iteration will be, um, will be uh, a frame. So you can see that. So after some iteration, the neural network captures the landscape of this target function. And after some more steps, it starts to capture high frequencies or this oscillation. 
And if we turn this into uh, the Fourier domain, so this red curve is the uh, Fourier transform of our target function. And this blue one, and this, okay, and this blue one is the Fourier transform of our neural network. So this is also a film. So we will, uh, this film will go as the iteration goes. So you can see that the neural network first capture the first frequency peak. And after all, so you will capture more and more frequency peaks. So this tells us that the neural network will learn from low frequency to high frequency. And one, once we know that it prefers low frequency, we also know that it's difficult to learn high frequency. So for example, in a reconstructing two dimensional image, this is my photo. So your input is in a two dimensional coordinate and your output is in a grayscale and we put all coordinates into the neural network and get it on a grayscale and put it together, you can get this image. And after some steps, it learns some cost brain structure and more and more steps, it learns more and more uh, fine structures. Okay, so this um, this knowledge has been uh, attracted by many other groups. So we know that neural networks are very bad at learning high frequency. So it's a, a kind of a shortage. So how to improve this shortcoming? So uh, we propose this multi-scale deep neural network. The idea is very simple. Uh, you have a very uh, high, highly oscillated function. And what is the meaning of frequency? For the high frequency, that means if you have small perturbation on input, you will have a very large deviation on output. And how to turn this high frequency into low frequency? We just need to stretch this line so it becomes uh, more flat, not so oscillated curve. And if you have the same magnitude of perturbation in the input, the output variation will be much smaller. Now, to implement this idea, we simply need to uh, add some coefficient in this uh, input. For example, originally we have uh, um, 30 neurons, all they have this uh, same structures. We just need to change this 10 to 30. But now we divide it into three groups. In the first group, we still use the uh, original scale. And in the second one, we plug a coefficient of two here, means we structure it into its double length. And in the third one, we uh, put a scale of three here. So we get a very simple uh, multi-scale neural networks. I think this is a very good example to show that in the neural the theory of neural networks is not going to tell you exactly how to tune the parameters, but tell you some direction. That means we show you a structure of multi-scale, but we actually don't tell you how exactly these parameters should be tuned. This is just a direction. So we, uh, in this um, framework, we tune the parameters and we find it's easy for functions like this. We saw some uh, PDE and it, its exact function is very harsh, all, highly oscillated. This red and blue means the target function is very oscillated. And use a normal neural network, you will use some flattened solution. That means it prefer low frequency. But once you use the same size multi-scale neural networks, it's very easy to tune that you can learn the target function well. And there are also many other studies and they've developed different kinds of uh, algorithms to try to improve the neural network for faster learning high frequencies. So this is an example that our study, uh, theoretical study can help us to guide uh, this uh, algorithm design. The second uh, example I want to talk in this uh, in this time is uh, condensation. So I will give, give a very toy example to show what is condensation. So for neural network, this is a, a neural network of two layers, only one hidden layer. And for the, for each hidden neuron, it has input weight and also output weight. At initialization, since we use random initialization, so their input weight are definitely very different. But we found that with proper initialization, the neural network after some training, you will see that the neurons in the hidden layer, you will be clustered. For example, in this case, the first two neurons, they are in the same group meaning that their input weight are exactly the same in this toy example. And for the, the other group, for these three neurons, they have also the same input weight from uh, the same uh, input neuron. So in this case, 
a neural network with a condensation phenomenon, meaning it actually is effective neural number is much smaller than it looks like. For example, in this case, these two neurons, they can be combined into one neuron and their output will just simply add up together. So this uh, five neural network can be um, can compressed into these two hidden neural network. So this is the condensation. So now we want to um, use some uh, simple experiments to show this condensation definitely can happen. So we use a very simple example. This is a two layer neural network and the input is X and this W is in the weight. But here weight is slightly different from our previous notation. So we just combine this um, input weight and bias together. So this X here is in a combination of original X and VEC and one, and number one. So um, we just a slightly abuse of notation. So this is the uh, inner product. Uh, we know for inner product, the direction is uh, actually is important. So we want to study the direction of this input weight. And also we want to see how much contribution of this neuron to the final output. So we also want to study the amplitude of each neuron. So the amplitude of each neuron is defined by the product of this output weight and also the norm of this input weight. So this is a very basic setting. Now we have a bit more exp explanation for 1D input. This the dimension of input X here is one. So the dimension of the weight WK here actually is two because it is consists of input weight W and also uh, this bias. So it's a 2D vector. And to indicate now, uh, direction of a two-dimensional ve vector we can use its orientation with respect to this x axis. So this phi can be used to uh, denote this w hat. And also for uh, activation function of ReLU, this activation function is quite simple. Smaller than zero is just a keep zero, and larger than zero is just an identity function y equal x. So consider the activation function with this wx plus b, and we know that this angle phi here, meaning its tangent is b over w. And b over w means what? If we just take uh, this w, and the, in a bracket, this will be x plus b minus uh, b over w. So this minus b over w is the, the position of this turning point. So each angle means uh, indicates a turning point of this uh, ReLU function. So study this angle has another uh, meaning for this uh, ReLU function. Now let's take a look of an um, example. In this example, we initialize the neural network in the linear regime. So what is linear regime? For example, for the, uh, we can linearize it, in the, uh, we can initialize it in the uh, NDK uh, setting. So now let's take a look at why it's called a linear uh, regime. So the green, uh, the the blue, uh, the, the green dots here, uh, each dot indicates one neuron, and its axis means uh, the orientation. So we use a number to indicate its orientation, and this y axis meaning its amplitude. That means how much uh, it contributes to the final output. And after training in this example, you can see that the red curve meanings the distribution after training. The difference between the initial one and the final training one, they are quite, quite close. If they are very, very close, well, and we, we want to uh, derive the output of uh, this final training, we can perform a Taylor expansion in the initial point and only need to keep the first order because they are close enough. So this model is a linear model. That's why we call this a linear regime. However, for neural network, its power is not in a linear regime. So we study another regime. In this regime, the parameters of the training will be very, very different from its initialization. Here is an example. So this each dot here is also indicated one neural. And the green dots means the initialization, and the red dots means the training, the ways after training. So we can see, okay, we have performed a normalization. So you can see the initialized uh, ways are very small compared 
with the waste of the training. So that also uh, indicates an information that uh, to get a nonlinear regime, we need to initialize the neural network with a small scale, such as a mean field scale or smaller than mean field scale. So in this example, you can see that after training, the neurons orientation that condensed into two directions. That is the reason why we call this regime condensed regime. Okay, so now let's take a look at what kind of function it learns. So there are four points that are here. So these are our training data. And we use a neural network to fit these four data. And in a nonlinear regime, condensed regime, after learning, the neural network output is quite a, um, is quite a, has some uh, uh, characteristic. But in a linear regime, you can take a look. It's just like uh, uh, a bit oscillate and do not have a very clear uh, uh, characteristics. So there are some uh, feature learning in uh, this uh, long linear or condensed regime. We take another look of more complex um, example. In this example, we have more training data, okay, more training data, and also a one dimensional example. And this is the training uh, loss. And this is an epoch, and this is a loss value. And we take uh, some training point to study their weight, just very similar, just um, but we. Uh, look at uh, this at a different uh, uh, at a different uh, <clears throat> uh, angle. Um, so this is the uh, W and this is the B, and each dot is one uh, neuron. So this is also a movie. So the, during the training, there are more and more uh, neurons condensed at a different uh, 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 orientations. Now let's take a look at the snapshot. So uh, this is W, this is B. So at the initialization. Uh, all neurons, they have very small um, amplitude of uh, waves. And their orientation are kind of random, okay, at the initialization. But after training at 100 uh, epochs, so you can see that some neurons, they evolved into one direction. So the, effectively, this neural network is a one neural network. And after some more training, you can see that more neurons, they evolved to another direction. So this neural network at this stage, just equivalent to two effective neurons. So more after more and more training, you can see that the neural network evolved to more and more effective neurons. So this is just a, some very artificial or synthetic data set. Now the question is, if this condensation also exists in practicalness, otherwise, well, do we need to study some kind of this uh, phenomena? So this is an example, a layer in the uh, ResNet 18. So this is an example uh, from um, uh, He Kai Ming's uh, ResNet paper. And we just now know that the pre-trained uh, parameters. But now for convolution neural network, we regard each convolution kernel as a unit or as a neural. And then we study the percent similarity between different um, convolutional kernels. So this number means the index of convolutional uh, kernel. And you can see there are many uh, kernels that have very high similarity, meaning they have very similar orientation. And some other neurons have another uh, similarity. They are also very similar, but with different orientation. This is the, uh, the case after training. And we also, uh, uh, re initialize the neural network, and we see that there is almost no um, condensation or similarity among the, any group of um, uh, convolution layers, convolution um, kernels. So condensation, actually, you can find it in the uh, real training of neural networks. So if so, now our question is, uh, if a condensed neural network can be equivalent to a small neural network, why don't we just train a very small neural network, but train a large neural network to get a condensed one? Why we need to waste so much of energy? So here's an example of previous uh, slices. So in this case, we use 1,000 neurons, but actually two ReLU neurons are enough to represent this function. So for original large neural network, and the 
trend small two relu neural network. What's the similarity and what's the difference between these two uh, neural networks to study this problem? So we trained a lot of neural networks and they have different ways. For example, this blue curve is a, a network of only one neuron and we trained uh, separately, independently, a lot of um, neural networks with different ways and put their loss function together. And we can see some very interesting phenomena that there are some uh, plateau of this loss function. And these different experiments, they have this very, very similar plateau. So for loss function, if you have a plateau, we might think that they are experiencing some uh, neighborhood of subtle point. Otherwise, why they will become so slow in the training. So we can get from this experiment that uh, they have some similar subtle points and same laws. And we also print their output function. So you can see that their output function are also very similar. And we also look at uh, their feature distribution. This is an orientation and this is an amplitude. And we can see for different neural networks that have very similar condensation. So we have this uh, phenomenon to indicate uh, us how to proceed to how to study this. So we further have make some statistics of all this uh, loss function. We count, we count how uh, the frequency of all loss in a small interval. For example, for the case of 1000 uh, neural network, we train this new neural network and we just have been the, the loss function, <clears throat> describe the loss function and count how many epochs stay in this uh, uh, bin interval. And for example, in here, you can see there's a plateau. So there are many epochs in this uh, interval. You can see uh, this will be more bright. So here, there are many epochs stay here. And here, there are also some plateau because there are many epochs here. So if there are, um, many um many epochs stayed at some uh, value loss value that is not a small meaning this training is very hard to go to very small uh, loss value now we put all neural network together so we can see that so for the neural network with um with uh, less neurons with few neurons so most of the um, epoch we all stayed at some uh, value like here and here. And these loss values are not small, okay? This loss value are not small, meaning they will stay at some high value loss, meaning they do not train well. But for neural network with very wide, uh, very many neurons with a very uh, large width, you can see they have uh, many uh, peaks in these uh, small values. So meaning, uh, for larger neural network, it might be easier to go to small uh, loss function, meaning loss values, meaning larger neural network might be easier to, for training. Okay, so to study why a uh, larger neural network can easier go to small, uh, small loss values. So we try to study in a connection between the small neural network and the large neural networks. So here's an example. So here is a neural network, and we try to split this um, black neuron into two neurons. So this is an L minus one layer. This is an L layer. This is an L plus one layer. So we split this uh, black neuron into two neurons, this black one, this blue one, and this purple one. And the input weight just uh, copied from original weight. So this is a uh, condensation case, right? We just build uh, can condense the neural network from a, a nano neural network. And their output, we just uh, split into with a fixed ratio alpha. This alpha can be uh, changed uh, between like zero and one. Um, so the output of this uh, uh, L plus one layer neuron should be same because we just build in this way. So we can easily prove that the output of nano neural network should be equal to the output of the white neural network. This is not nothing interesting, but something very interesting is if the nano neural network is in a critical point, what is the critical point? Meaning the gradient of the loss function with respect to the parameters equal to zero, then you can prove for this large neural network, 
is also in a critical point. So by this embedding principle, we just uh, connect the critical points among the loss function of different ways. And we can further prove for larger neural network, the critical points will have a larger degeneracy and also that we are almost have more descent direction. So even though for the nano or for the wider neural network, they are effectively the same and they have a very similar output. For the nano neural network, it may be in the local minimum, but for larger neural network, it's highly likely is a subtle point and it has a lot of descent direction. So in such case, Although in the approximation sense, they are almost equivalent, but in a training sense, larger neural network may be faster in training. Okay. Now the question goes to why the condens condensation can happen. Okay. So we're starting the different stage of, uh, of the training. So for the initial, initial training we found, if the neural networks ways are very, very small, you can prove the neural network's width seems always goes to some condensed orientation. And this orientation is, in most of the case, they are very few. The number of the orientation are very few. Okay, however, we can also estimate when they will converge to this isolated orientations. However, for gradient descent, the condens condensation requires very small initialization. That is because the neurons in the same layer, their only difference among different neurons is their label. And their dynamics are very are exactly the same. So for this dynamics, it has some fixed point. And all neurons, if it, they are initialized very small, their difference actually are very small. So they will go to this um fixed um these fixed points. And these fixed points are very uh, the number is very small. So uh, after some training time, you will see that these neurons will be have very similar. And that is the initial condense. However, if the initialization weight are very small, you can see that during the training, they will, they will often experience some uh, plateau or meaning that it will go to very close to these subtle points. That will be, very bad thing because the training is too slow. So can we um, find a way that uh, you can get a condensed result and also have a faster uh, training? So that is the job art. We found that, that job art training technique can facilitate the condensation in the whole training, even for very large initialization. So here is the uh, meaning of job art. For a neural network um, during the training, at each training epoch, we will mask some neurons randomly. For example, we mask these two at this epoch, but in another epoch, we may mask another two neurons. Okay, so neurons are randomly masked. And to balance the output, or to make the output um, stable, uh, once we mark some neurons, we will amplify the rest of the output of rest of neurons. For example, if you mask half neurons, half number of neurons, so you will double the output of the rest of half neurons. So this is the idea of job art. So now let's consider in this case, suppose you have a group of team members and some members may call a sick, a sick leave randomly uh, during some like a pandemic period. So to get your, your team works uh, smoothly, uh, you should uh, let others can replace those who call for sick leave, right? And how can they replace those are not uh, um, he, uh, in, in the group? And the only way is you just make all your team members are very powerful and they are very uh, similar. They have the same skills, right? So once some people are not here, uh, the other people can uh, replace these um, members. So this is the idea. So after final training, the, new, the job owner will try to make neurons try to be uh, as similar as they can. So we perform some uh, experiments. Here is um, the the blue uh, the blue points are training data, and if we initialize this neural network work with quite a large um, 
uh, quite a large magnitude. You can see after some training, uh, the neural network can fit this training data points. However, they are very oscillated. And we know that in most of the case, it's not, it cannot generalize well. But if we use some uh, job out, a very uh, slightly job out, you can see all other settings are the same. The output will be uh, much more flat and you can uh, fit in the new the training data quite well. If you look at uh, this uh, uh, feature distribution, uh, this um, X is also an orientation of input and this Y is the um, amplitude of each neuron. So without a job out, it's just very similar to the linear regime. However, with job out, you can see the the ways after the distribution after training, it condensed at a full orientation, meaning uh, it condensed very well. So for free layer neural networks, we can get a very similar result. You can also get a condensed result and quite a flat result. Okay, so we perform some theoretical analysis and we can derive that an expectation of job out loss actually equals to a regional mean square loss plus some extra uh, regularization term. And because these two terms are not exact, are not implicit, are not explicitly shown in your training laws. So we call these two uh, implicit regularization. So now let's under, uh, try to understand what's the meaning of this um, uh, implicit regularization. So suppose we consider a model with only two neurons. So this A1 and A2, uh, these two neurons. And we also consider two, training data. The target function is uh, the case of one, uh, one neuron. So now if we have a perfect fitting, you should have this neural network. The output at each data point equals to a large target function. For example, at X, X1, so its target is sigma X1. And the neural network output is the A1 sigma uh, W1 X1 and plus the second neuron. So it's in the, for the second data point. And if we put uh, the output uh, in a vector, so this is the target vector, and this is the output of the first neuron, and this is the output of the second neuron. So our target is to make the neural network fit the data perfect. So this O1 plus O2 should equal to this O star. This is naturally. However, for job out, it has an extra regularization that it requires the norm of O1 and O2, the summation should be as small as possible. So what's the meaning? For example, you want to have uh, uh, this final result um, of, uh, of, of some data. It can be um, summed by this uh, yellow pair or this red pair, right? They should equal to the same. However, they have very different effects. Their norm are very different. For this case, the norm is much larger. For this case, the norm is smaller. So by the regularization of job out, you will select this one. So the neural network will find uh, this ways parallel. So here's another example. If you have some uh, training data and after some training, you get uh, this uh, learning result indicated by this uh, black curve. If you have this job out, okay? So you will turn this, uh, this angle into flat, just one neuron can replace uh, this fitting. Or you have a lot of intercept or this turning, uh, turning point during uh, one, uh, during two data, consecutive data. After uh, this graduation of job art, you can see it use a neuron to replace so many neurons. So these are some illuminating example. So now we have this condensation. We try to understand why there's condensation. So what, condensation can benefit in generalization. So here's an example. So in this example, they use a network of 100 uh, of um, 1 million, more than 1 million parameters to feed uh, 60,000 uh, image data point and they can get 100% accuracy at the training and also more than um, almost 90% accuracy for test uh, data. So in this example, the, number of parameters are much larger than the number of training data. However, the neural network can still generalize quite well. Now our question is, does the neural network really have so many effective neurons? That is the question. So here, for example, in this example, we have mentioned the two neurons actually are already enough, right? 
So the effective neurons actually are only two. So here make us to rethink a very, the traditional the traditional issue. So what kind of how many samples? Or what's the relation of the number of samples and the relation of the number of the, the relation between the numbers of samples and the number of parameters? What kind of relation to determine the generalization? So in traditionally, if you have a model with n parameters, how many samples is needed? If you consider the worst case, you better have at least m parameters so you can recover each parameter well. However, now let's consider a case in neural network. We consider a teacher student set up. The target function is a neural network with only two hidden neurons. And the model has a lot of hidden neurons. Now we use this very large neural network to learn this small neural network. Now let's take a look at this result. If you initialize this neural network uh, in a linear regime without a job out, after training, uh, this, this number is the, the number of training, the training size, and this color indicates the test error. So you can see, so you need a lot, a lot of samples to uh, make the generalization better. But once you have job out, you have condensation, right? You have condensation in the number, the effective number of neurons is actually quite small. So how many sample size you need? How much sample size? That is six. Why is six? Because for each neuron, you have input weight, you have bias, you have output weight. So for each neuron, you have six parameters. In such case, you only need to need a six samples then you can recover this exact neuron, this exact target function. Okay, so this uh, help us to, uh, to consider a new concept. In previously, we always consider the worst case, we have M parameters, we need uh, M samples, we never consider uh, the target function. So just as I have mentioned, a good theory should lead to more interesting phenomena or theory. In this case, we from a study from our experiments or our condensation uh, study, we actually extend the worst case estimation of the samples needed for good generation to another perspective. That is, what is optimistic case to recover an exact function? So previously, maybe we worry that although you have this optimistic uh, estimation, but can we get it? Okay, now here is the, 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 the example. So for neural network, as the neural network can have a condensed solution. So once your target function only has two neurons, you will try to find a network with less and less effective neurons. So if in this case, now we consider another way to estimate how much number, how many sample we need. So what is the best initialization if we want to train a neural network? If you initialize this neural network near some global minimum, very, very close to some global minimum, then this neural network, definitely you can represent this by first order tele expansion and uh, this uh, global minimum. So the neural network in this case can be effectively as a, a linear model, right? And so the fitting becomes a kind of linear regression plot because our model now actually is a linear model. And the basis is, is, um, uh, is composed by the this um, a gradient of the target function with respect to uh, these parameters. So how many samples, do, if we want to do this uh, linear regression, definitely uh, that it depends on the dimension of this linear space. So if the uh, dimension of this um, linear space, or uh, this tangent space around this uh, global minimum is very small, such as the case in the condensed case, the dimension is very, very, very small. For example, all neurons are the same. So the effective neural network size actually is uh, only one neuron, and the dimension size actually is the dimension of one neural network. So based on this um, consideration, actually we can define this model rank. This model rank uh, is the dimension of the tangent space around this uh, parameter theta prime. 
So theta prime is um, one of a global minimum. Next, uh, we know that we have a lot of global minimum for an over for uh, over parameterized neural network. So we can find the minimum model rank or the minimum dimension of to define the of big sample size. So in this case, we know that oh, two neurons actually are enough to uh, reconstruct this target function. So the of big sample size should be in a, a tangent space around this um, uh, two neuron, uh, neuron networks and the dimension should be six. So uh, the best case is we use six samples re to reconstruct this um, target function. And in experiments, we found if the neural network can be condensed, then six samples is enough. So let's reconsider this relation between the samples and the number of samples and the number of parameters. Previously, if we consider the worst case, that the number should a lot of the samples should be a lot, at least larger than the number of parameters. But now, actually, we have another bound. This bound is the uh, we call the op optimistic sample size. So this usually be very much much smaller than the number of parameters. Meaning we have chance to reconstruct this uh, target function with very very few uh, samples. So here's an example. Suppose we want to reconstruct this target function. So one way we can use the network with exactly the same structure but unknown parameters. The other way we can use a neural network with more uh, connections, or we can use a, a wider neural network. We just uh, double the number of neurons in the hidden layer. So the unknown parameters in these two cases are both 24. But we can guess which one can be better to reconstruct uh, this uh, neural network given a uh, fixed sample size. So we know that the neural networks in this case it cannot condense because every neuron should be used, okay? But there are so many connections and each connection can be can contribute another uh, dimension in the tangent space. However, uh, this uh, wide neural network, you can see that if you have this condensed uh, result, then these two neurons, they can be effective into one neuron. So if you have condensation, the neurons does not increase the local dimension of your global minimum. So the number of sample size will not increase. That is one of the reasons why we use such large neural network, but we actually don't need to increase our sample size. We can still get a quite a good result, generalization result, okay? So we try to attempt to answer some important questions such as why neural network can fit at uh, this over parameterization because this uh, nonlinear uh, neural network, it has um, non-constant optimistic sample size. It, once you can have this condensation, you can um, find this, um, you have a large chance to find this optimistic uh, sample size. And what is the effective of the size of a, a nonlinear model? That is, you can just look at uh, this, um, um, uh, the model range we just uh, defined. For the implicit bias, we can say the neurons um, prefers the, the case with um, more effect, more uh, condensed result or uh, less effective neurons. And for neural networks, in the, neurons in the same layer, once you increase the number of layers, um, you can increase the express, expressiveness, but you don't um, have too much uh, cost in uh, increasing the sample size. And that is also an example we try to explain why neuron convolution neural network can uh, help a generalization uh, better than fully connected neural networks in some case. So let's get back to this um, Leo Bremann's case. Why don't have a uh, parameterized neural network over fit? Because for this frequency principle organization, they are independent of network size and the effective neural number uh, is the condensed uh, network. And why the neural network do not uh, uh, head for poor local minimum because this uh, embedding principle will um, uh, 
will let this larger neural networks for the subtle point has a lot of descending direction. So the training will uh, go to a smaller loss and easy to escape. And when should we start uh, stop this uh, training uh, and use the current parameters? For many cases, the early stopping, you can avoid it. Uh, feed many um, much high frequency noise so it can help uh, uh, generalization. So the last thing is, can we help to guide for design algorithms? Here's an one example. So we use this um, condensed idea. If a neural network, whenever it's condensed, uh, it can help um, during the training, easier for training. And after training, uh, we actually can um, Mm, prune this uh, neural network by compress this uh, very similar neurons into one. So here's an example. We use um, neural network to uh, as a celebrate model for ODE, uh, ODE equations and as the source term for combustion simulation. So original neural network is quite large. So once we uh, use a reduced one based on our compression uh, technique, by this um, condensation. We found that this compressed neural network behave very similar to an original large neural network. So this is a, a pruning technique. So uh, this is a, a, a final, uh, this is an adder for our general uh, machine learning and also the, uh, also with uh, Dongbin and Yi Qianxiao are also, the, uh, also our editorial board. So um, I will conclude my talk. Um, I briefly talk about a pre, uh, frequency principle and the condensation. And these are my uh, collaborators. And thanks for your listening and welcome any questions. All right, he's, he's been here? Not sure. <laughs> Maybe okay. I, I yeah, he, maybe you ended a bit early, but uh, yeah, okay. Uh, oh yeah, he, he's here. But what, what what just happened? I I I, I, I just dropped. Well, was the meeting? You know, what, what, was the meeting room was still up?